There we go. <laughs> so, hi, Kevin. How are you today? Very good. Thanks for having me. So, uh, when it comes to technology and when it comes to climate change and sustainability, what what role can technology play in addressing climate change and sustainability? So for me, uh, the things that come to my mind is I don't necessarily think of it purely about technology. I think of more about like the Internet. Right. So I've, I've spent my career vastly in the Internet and the Internet always does what the Internet does. It like doesn't matter what web we're in, you know, one, two, three and whatever comes after. But it's about how do you disintermediate the information? So how do you take those that used to have that information and now it's in the hands of the consumer? So when you start looking at sustainability, some of the big issues are people don't know what's happening in different parts of the world. So you just start off with general knowledge transfer of these are the issues here, these are the issues there, and then there's sort of the opportunity. After you get the knowledge in place, then what you need to do is do what the internet does as well. And that's just leverage a bit of data I mean, if, if you have data on what solutions work, what solutions don't work, which companies are building them, um, then as an investor, for example, or maybe you're donating into a cause, you know, whatever sort of capital is going into it, you, you need that data to, to build trust layers so that you understand, hey, this money went to this company as an investor or maybe you're a donor. And if the internet just provides it. It's, it's, it's a data platform and it's that backbone and that gateway that, um, you know, I remember a time when, when I wasn't using the internet to do everything I do. And now we take for granted that like, okay, I can look up this product in the store um, right while I'm standing there, or I can search a solution and then I can buy it very quickly, not in all parts of the world. And so I think technology is just, it's just an enabler. It's, it's, it's that scaling factor of knowledge, data, building trust. Um, and I think, unfortunately, though, there's been times where there's misinformation out there. And we've all seen that um, over the last, particularly, I'd say about the last decade. And I think we have to be very careful that sometimes what you see on the internet is clearly not true. Um, and you got to be a little bit more you know, a little bit more prudent about what you're looking at. And when it gets into sustainability, it's the same thing. I mean, people have to see like, is this a real thing? Cause there are scammers, right? There are people out there that'll try to make you feel good about doing something or feel that this is a good investment. But if they haven't provided some sort of, you know, consensus mechanism or data layer that gives you the ability to go, ah, okay, I can see that there's enough validating points that what's happening here is actually happening. Does that make sense? It actually makes sense uh, when it comes to, yeah, and especially also in journalism, at least when it comes to, um, you know, misinformation. But I'm just like uh, curious, like what kind of mechanisms are you guys using, especially as investors, you know, to detect like, you know, scammers and, you know, because lately, um, I mean, it happened to a couple of friends of mine, you know, that there were a lot of scammers and especially also when people are trying to hire other people on LinkedIn or, you know, when they're trying to find a job. And I'm just curious to see, like, when it comes to, you know, the, an investor's point of view. Um, so I can, I can speak on behalf how we use technology because our, our platform is funneling capital, right, from Western Europe into markets that are needing the capital to reduce carbon emissions. And one of the first things we make sure we do is we have multiple layers of sources of information, right? So. Somebody can post up information online and say, this is what's going on, but is there another mechanism? Is there another third party? Are there other people that are agreeing to what that information is? Basically the way the blockchain works, right? So we leverage a little bit of that. Um, we don't use a ton of it because like any data system, it can be garbage in and garbage out. On blockchain, you're going to have to take a lot of effort to make the garbage in and garbage go out. But we've also seen that happen as well. Um, so for us, it's it's getting multiple layers. And then <clears throat> there's just really simple stuff that's not um, ingrained in like any sort of deep tech. And that's just like, is there verification of the products being sold? 
from the supplier. Like that's super easy. Did they buy X amount of products? Yes, they did. Okay, so then they're reporting that they've sold X amount of products. Do those numbers foot? It's just like really simple accounting. And then the third layer for us too is, okay, one could argue this could be manipulated, but looking at photos of, of people and the products and the solutions, right? So with our platform, it's selling, uh, it's investing into solutions in renewable energy and off-grid communities, right? So like Sub-Saharan Africa. So if somebody is saying, yeah, we sold the products, we're doing this, we're doing that, but you don't have something as simple as a picture, which like I said, of course, deep fakes, people could manipulate that. But if you have all these other layers around it, you're able to triangulate like, okay, this really happened. Um, and then of course, you know, an, an, another piece is where you can use um, smart contracts, right? So more often than not, um, in particular in our case, like you're, you're not next to the investment. So, um, I'm here based in Geneva, Switzerland. So I need to provide trust to my community that where the money is going, things are actually happening. So you put in these smart contracts and the smart contracts say, Hey, when, when X amount happens, then this is what happens. If X amount doesn't happen, then it doesn't happen. And there's no, you know, there's no human intervention in there that allows for something to happen or not happen. And so that's how you also motivate the other side, which is when the capital gets there, hey, you know what, if you perform and do the right set of um, activities that are reducing carbon emissions, then you're able to get more attractive rates or access to more capital or whatever it may be. So it's it's just putting a, you know some basic sense into it, but I think a little bit of tech helps to make that much easier to to achieve. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, tech should, you know, make things more achievable and, you know, also fast in your work, I would say. And another question that I have for you is regarding to purpose as a new climate fi finance platform. How did you come up with the concept and how is it going? Uh, it's going really good. Um... You know, everybody thinks when you found a company, you have this like aha moment. Um, I think of it more like little seeds that sort of were planted along uh, the, the portions of my career. And the first one was when I was at Yahoo, um, helped to create the Yahoo Employee Foundation. And we actually invested in a company that did clean, renewable energy and off-grid communities. So exactly where purpose is going. But with, that was a direct investment to the company. And I got absolutely fascinated by the idea, the concept, like here's a product that reduces carbon emissions. It helps people's lives. It saves them money. Their livelihoods are better. Their kids are getting better grades. Like they were using kerosene and wood before, and now there's this clean renewable energy and they don't have fumes in their home or, you know, they don't have the risk of something falling over and there's, you know, burns down the house. And so that was like the first sort of little um, I don't know, idea in my head. I mean, I, I, I spent my career in digital marketplaces and that's what I loved, but I started seeing like, ah, oh, there's, there's something there. That was, that was 12 years ago. And then the further along I got into my career, um, I eventually was like, okay, all in, let's dive into this whole impact sector. Um, and I started working with and for uh, an impact accelerator here in Geneva. And I was seeing these bright minds come to to the accelerator and they were starting off with with profit and purpose and honestly i started out in banking long time ago it wasn't for me um but i saw this like this is how companies being founded not that it started with a profit only motive and like oh we need to find purpose and let's rebrand ourselves into something else and i was blown away because i started to realize it can be done um, but when you're at an accelerator, you're advising, you're not, you're not doing the work, right? So I really wanted to build that up. And when we looked at purpose, it was a question of like, where is the biggest challenge that we can address? And that biggest challenge for us is there's a climate crisis going on. We know the breakdown of the problems. We need more capital and the solutions that are existing today so that we can transition from fossil fuels. And because I had been in that sector and I had that time to learn about these models and build an investor community around me, um, pull together the investors and, you know, kick things off in 2022. So it's second part of the question is how it's going. Uh, it's the normal founder story. 
you know, it's, it's up and down, uh, it's exciting and super frustrating the next day. Um, we did a, um, um, uh, we were in a, a private beta over the summer. Uh, we learned a lot through that, made a lot of mistakes. And then we did our public beta, I think we're up to five weeks now. Um, it is a beta, you know, it's, it's got some errors, it's got some bugs in it. Um, but we're getting some great feedback and we're, we're learning a lot about who the climate conscious are, um, what they care about, what they don't care about. Um, and, and it's going really well. Like it's, it's resonating. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, it's, it's always about the feedback, you know, probably that's, that's going to help you more than any other, you know, strategies that you have like along the way. And uh, you were also at the CV Summit and um, one of my question is, um, were you also inspired by other, um, you know, entrepreneurs, especially on the climate field? Um, I'm trying to think if there was a climate company at the CV Summit, um, other than us. I mean, there was definitely companies that are doing solutions that are more like in, um, um, you know, transferring capital. Like there's a, a great company in, uh, CV's portfolio called, um, Koala Pay. That's pretty impressive. Uh, there's another one called House of Africa. That's all about how you put on chain, uh, ownership rights. I'm sure I'm, I'm misrepresenting exactly what they do. So there's, there's great companies that are figuring out different ways in which blockchain is, is a force for good. And many of them are doing it in developing markets. Um, and it's interesting because one of the reflections, um, I, I think I sort of came across at the CV summit is in developed markets, we look at blockchain and web three technologies as like almost like aspirational, like, oh, we're going to make capital and we're going to decentralize this and decentralize that. And it's all sort of very, I feel like it's a bit insular. It's, it's too just like, like inside web three community. But then when you get into developing markets, whether it's climate or not, they're doing it out of necessity because those, those trust layers that many of us in developed markets take for granted, for example, the registry of your home, like, I don't think twice, like, does the Swiss government really know if I have this home or have this home? But in developing markets, that infrastructure layer is not there, right? Or if it's capital going into developing markets, the transaction costs to get it there and get it out and to be deployed and, and have trust behind it. So it's not specific to climate as much as it is developing markets are doing it out of necessity. They, they need to fix the inefficiencies we think we have inefficiencies in our developed markets man we have no idea what inefficiencies are right um but you know there's there's tons of players in the in the climate and sort of refi space that are looking to build solutions that funnel capital more efficiently into capital efficient um or excuse me climate efficient solutions and you know there's companies like um fallow um, Toucan, um, who am I forgetting? Flow Carbon. These guys are all chasing after um, the carbon credits market and, and they need to because the carbon credits market, it's a mess. I'm, I'm glad I'm not in that space. So I think there's there's plenty of examples where Web3 is, is becoming a force for good in climate. A lot of them are pretty early. Um, and I think a lot of them are, are still sort of finding their fit because the, the hard part is, and I learned this the hard way, um, that intersection between the climate conscious consumer and let's draw another circle over here of Web3, it's pretty small. So if you're a climate conscious consumer and you see something that has a Web3 name to it, like, I don't know, NFT, they can sometimes have an allergic reaction. You know, it's like, ah, uh, there's, you know, those have gone up and this is ridiculous and da, 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 versus if they knew the backbone of what Web3 was meant to do and, and that transparency later and owning your data and, you know, all the things that we know that it's about, I think they'd be, they'd be really excited and they would think about how it's, uh, it's powerful for them, but 
the, the circle of climate conscious consumers is also like this big, right? <laughs> and the Web3 is still, it's growing. It's thankfully growing, right? Um, but I think we we have, we owe it to ourselves in Web3 to, to build out solutions um, that apply to the real world and allow folks to see what the power is. I mean, I've, I've lived through all the webs, right? And, and the same thing happened, right? Like you, you go through this, a cycle, you go through a cycle. Yeah, exactly. No, I'm, I'm also fascinated about Web3 and, you know, when it comes to Web3 solutions and what they can do actually with a lot of business models that I've seen. Uh, what are you most excited about uh, Web3 and also climate when it comes to the future? And what are your expectations um, I think the most exciting thing for me would be looking at how Web3 matures so we can address that issue I was just talking about a minute ago, because I think we just have, we, we, we need people to understand the, the, the concepts and the ideas and, and not get burned out by the headlines of FTX and the media covering that way more than they need to, right? I mean, someone should actually do the math of how many scams there were in, in Web3 versus traditional finance, and then like wake the world up. Because it's like, yes, they're there, but like, what, why don't you go look at traditional finance? Go look back at 2008 and Lehman Brothers and all the nonsense that happened there and the amount of wealth that was wiped off the planet because of people being stupid. So I think Web3 owes it to itself to continue to find solutions and, and mature. And I, I don't think we, we've, fully solved for it yet. I do get excited that, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I would bring up this solution and it like people didn't understand it. Now I belong into a segment called refi, which is regenerative finance, right? And it's an even smaller sector of the web three world. But the point being is folks are seeing it. And, and to me, it's, it's just really a maturity of solution, maturity of adoption. And when I get excited is, is actually very selfishly a little bit on our platform. And that is when you can bridge web two solutions, because not web three is not for everybody, but when you can bridge web two solutions into web three in a way that doesn't scare somebody, right? I mean, going on MetaMask for a lot of people is, ooh, you know, that's, that's like a complicated thing for them. And so I get excited about how we're able to leverage Web3 and not even know that it's happening in the background. And to be honest, that's what I think most of the web solutions have happened in the past. Like people kind of came out with this, oh, look at this tech, it can do this, it can do that. And they're talking about the technology, which is what Web3 did forever. You know, all the acronyms and all the things, and it alienates people. Whereas if I think we pull back and say, look, this, this is about owning your data, this is about the opportunity for you to transact and be connected. Uh, things are immutable. There's transparency. There's consensus layers. There's just all these things that need to happen. And, and big picture, it just needs to be matured in a way so that the everyday person uses it and they don't even know they're using it. Does exactly. that make sense? It, it, it really does. But how can we actually ensure, because you said previously that not, Web3 is probably not for everybody and we understand also the whys here behind. But how can we just make sure that there's more transparency and people are not really getting scared when it comes to, you know, Web3 adoption, you know, to your business? And how did it actually work for you guys? Were you really thinking about that through before? Yeah, so that that's actually um, a big part of the evolution of our company through through lessons learned and sort of that user feedback. Uh, we start off with a very tokenized model and tokenomics and all of that stuff, but we quickly bagged it because of what I was saying to you earlier about the the, the sectors um, not having a lot of uh, overlap. I think how we do it um, is you 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 got to show something outside of Web three that the, the benefit comes from, and so to you know promote a company I have nothing to do with, but I love what they're doing is, is Goldfinch. I mean, I think Goldfinch is now put it might already be at a hundred million. It was close to that not long ago. When when you're 
enabling capital flows to not just be in centralized finance, when you're enabling people to have access to solutions that normally were not accessible before, when you're providing real world benefit, right? So if Goldfinch, for example, is lending to, um, you know, companies and SMEs, I don't, I don't know their full value prop. Um, and then those companies go and build products and then those companies go and hire employees and those companies go and provide economic growth and value. That's how I think it has to come into play. You, you have to break out of the Web3 bubble and, and provide not real world assets, but real world benefit. That doesn't mean that you're like a Web3 native. Yeah, it actually makes sense when when we are thinking about that. That's a good point of view. And the last question that I actually I'm actually asking this question to to everyone. Um, do you think that technology should be rather perceived as our friend or our enemy and why? What's what's the reason? Um, I'm very technology pro, so I, I have a very biased uh, viewpoint. And, and that is I try and throw technology at any solution I can. You know, something as simple as um, my shopping list. You know, I mean, how many people still walk around with a piece of paper? I don't get it. I don't understand. My grandma it. does. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. But I mean, I know people my generation. I'm Gen X. I'm on the edge of Gen X. There's barely Gen X. Um, and so I think it's your friend, um, so long as you're informed as to what's going on. And and I think that's the hard part. And I think that's where it becomes not your enemy, but it sort of have to do a little bit of trust, but verify. You were talking about the example in media a, a minute ago, right? You think about how much nonsense we have read. What's it been five years, maybe? Um, maybe not that long, where just absolute total ridiculous information makes it out to the web and people say, oh, well, I read it on the internet, right? I saw a TikTok video. I saw this, I saw that. And it's like the second it's there, there's this like all of a sudden trust factor just because, uh, you know, some pixels showed up on your screen and you're like, oh man, I saw this video, this really happened. And so I think, I think it is our friend, but I think we have to be very careful. And, and I think the advent of how AI can do so much and every six months they say AI can't do that and then it does it, right? So I think we're, we're in for a very interesting time where there's probably gonna need to be some, I don't know if it's a governing body, I don't know if it's a regulation, I don't know if it's a certification, I don't like that, but I do like the idea of some form of a industry self-governed rule. Um, I mean, Facebook started doing this during COVID um, and I think it's after what happened with the, the elections in the U S and other places where like, Hey, this information may or may not be validated. They do a little signal on it. Okay. Some people say, oh, that's censorship. That's nonsense. Oh, fine, whatever. But I think the media is the, the, the second leg or fifth leg or whatever it is of the government. And if, if the information we see out there in technology, which is, I think the main area I think about is information I consume on a screen, isn't regulated in some way, as much as I hate regulation, there's gotta be something that, that provides a, a trust factor or, you know, put in the wrong hands, nonsense is gonna get into people's brains. There's already tons of it already out there. And I don't know how to solve it. Somebody really smart will figure out how to do that. It's not me. Yeah, unfortunately, that's uh, that's also not me either. I mean, I'm trying to, um, I'm also trying to build trust when it comes to the information that I'm actually presenting. Sure. And I think that there is a lot of deep fake out there and we really need to fast check everything. It, it can't really just go out there and, you know, being just a piece of information that you're not, you know, it's not being verified, it's not being, you know, checked or whatever, even if it comes to an article that you're presenting, even if it comes to, you know, an interview or whatever you're saying, I think that people need to be more mindful when it comes to what they're saying, of course. Totally, totally. And you know what I think? I think there's some generational differences to that challenge of, of information, right? So I think of older generations, if it was on the news, it was true, right? That's it. And so I think older generations, and I'm not trying to be an ageist or anything, but I've experienced it, 
where they read something and they're like, oh, it has to be true. And then I'm like, hey, give me a second. I'm, I'm going to show you it's not right. And then my son, he'll go on, he'll go on TikTok. He'll see a video and he's now started to say, and I fact checked it, dad. I looked and I found that it was real because 90% of the time he says to me, I saw this on TikTok. Great. Let's, let's dig into it. I want to see if that's real as well. Right. So there's, it, it, it's a tough one, but I think next generations are like, Hey, I'm on to you. And I think older generations are just trusting it because it made it onto the screen, not thinking, Ooh, that, that could be total nonsense. Right. So short, long, long winded answer to it's our friend. It empowers us. It encourages us. It connects the two of us on a call right now. Exactly. Right? So it can, it can also be our friend. If you're asking me, I think that it can be both. Like I, I really wanted to do like a video explaining why it can be really both of you know both of them even our friends but also like our enemy and most most of the people who i'm actually interviewed you know they they told me that most of them told me that it's actually both and it's I a agree. frenemy <laughs> as they it is I, I i i'll say it now and maybe we get to look back at this video one day that ai mm -hmm. component is really going to be something that needs to be looked after and we need to be very careful. I, I produced a video the other day in five languages. What? Really? In my, in my voice. Okay, I need to hear the Italian version, okay? <laughs> uh, yeah, I wonder if I'll have the right sound, but, but the point being is that's also a friend because I can communicate in my voice to someone else that I don't speak their language. Now, how well the translation is done, I don't speak Italian, I don't know. But the point being is that becomes your friend, but it also becomes a little bit scary of like, wow, that that was my voice. Like that was amazing, right? So yeah, there's, there's a lot of opportunity out there. We just, we got to embrace it um, because if you don't, it's going to run right past you anyway. Yeah, I think that we have to embrace the change and we really need to, you know, befriend technology, especially in this generation particularly and uh, yeah, yeah. absolutely absolutely yeah so thank you so much again it's been a pleasure having you here and i'm pretty sure that we have to you know we have to do the second part or i i don't know i'm really thinking about probably the next topic will be ai and you know and i would love to dig, i love to dig in that we use some ai in the office quite a bit um so i'm, I'm happy to share how we're using that and and hopefully we uh are in a great, we have a great story to tell about all these other things we're doing as well. Yeah, definitely. So thank you so much again. It was a pleasure having you here and hope to have you again on another podcast episode for SciTech Suisse. Happy to. Thank you again. Thank you.